cultural connections. Join us as we explore the diversity of Kent. So good morning, everybody. My name is Marty Fisher. I'm the HR director for the city. And I'm really happy you're here for the second installment of our cultural community conversation. And the goal of this program is to educate us and get to know our neighbors better. We have lots of diversity in the city, lots of different groups that are represented. And our goal is to educate so that we can support. It's not to persuade, more to educate and help us understand the things that we can do to get to know our neighbors and provide the service that uh, we're, we're famous for. This morning we have a member of the Sikh community, Harjit Singh, uh, who is here to talk to us about um, his culture and his traditions, and so I welcome Harjit. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking Marty Fisher, the Sikh Press Association and Basis of Sikhi for allowing me to come here and speak to you all on the culture and tradition of Sikhi. Now, I think to just get it out of the way, you know, when you were approached with this sort of presentation, the sort of mentality is that, okay, are we going to run through the facts and just, you know, how we can interact with the community? But I want to seek something deeper. So in the sense that I want to explain to you guys what Sikhi really means, what Sikhism really is. So in order to allow you to have better conversations and interactions with the community, because I could run through and say 99% of the people in America wear turbans, we've been here for over 100 years, and then that could sort of help you, here's what you say, here's what you don't say. But I feel that if we're able to approach Sikhism at a deeper level and allow you to understand the traditions and the customs, then the interactions you have with the Sikh community will become not so much that they're simply transactions where you're just there to gain something, the Sikhs there to gain something, but rather you'll be able to gain, and gain an understanding for Sikhi at a deeper level. So to begin, I think we should just go through the terms of Sikhi. To really begin, you know, there's a lot of always, people are confused, is it Sikh or is it Sikh? So when referring to the individual or the people, it's Sikh. So that's a group of Sikhs over there. I am a Sikh, that's my Sikh friend. But when referring to the religion, so if I was having a conversation, I would refer to Sikh as Sikhi. So that's the term for Sikhism. That is the Sikh term we use. So S-I-K-H, Sikh, that's the pronunciation, so I'm speaking to a Sikh. But if we're talking about the relig religion, we add the I on the end, S-I-K-H-I, and it becomes Sikhi. Now, the, basically, Gurbani. Now, what Gurbani is, is what we believe to be the divine revelation. So for Sikhs, it is written by the Gurus. Sikhs had 10 gurus, which we'll dwell, dwell into a little later on, but just for the vocabulary, Gurbani is basically what we believe to be the divine revelation. You could equate it to basically what we believe to be our holy text. Only with Sikhi, it goes a bit further, but I'll dwell in that, into that a little later. Now, in Sikhi, there's also the concept of karma. So the translation into English is quite simply just karma, but typically when we associate karma, we think of so basically what you do, same thing will happen to you, or everything goes around, comes around. With Sikhi, it also goes a bit deeper, and it's important to understand this because we're going to be talking about Gurbani and Karam and Sikhi and all at a deeper level. So what we believe for Karam to be, so karma, we believe that it's not only your actions, but also your thoughts and what you believe and your words. So it goes further than just what I do. It's a play of what's within your mind. So you could believe something, but do something something else, but we feel that you're still going to be judged and held to account for how you interact and what you think on a daily. Now, core. So every Sikh that's initiated into the Sikhi path, into the religion, all females are given the surname Kaur. Because within the Punjabi community, something you'll notice is that you'll probably have a lot of interactions with Singh and Kaur, but then after that, you'll find that there's always like a last, last name. The thing is, that name is typically the caste name. Sikhi abolished caste, you know, for its unfair practices. So for that reason, when Sikhs are initiated into the Khalsa Panth, the Khalsa's initiate of baptized Sikhs, they let go of all of their names and all the females become Kaur to empower the women. So Kaur, basically a translation into English would be a princess and or queeness. So basically, it's to give honor, a royal surname to all Sikh females. So any Kaur you'll interact with, any Sikh female will have the last name Kaur. Whereas males, they're given Singh. So all Sikh males have the last name Singh. So my name would be Harjot Singh. My sister, she would be Gersharn Kaur. So we go Singh and Kaur. It's very easy to remember. All females Kaur, all males have the last name Singh. And the meaning of Singh is lion or tiger. So it's also a royal surname. Because at the time when Sikhi came to be, there was a lot of oppression in the world. So it was at a time to uplift people, we decided to adopt these names and we were blessed with the name Singh and Kaur. Now, to continue the Khalsa, as I mentioned, the Khalsa is the initiated body of an 
is the initiated body of collective Sikhs. So where you have the Sikhi path, when it goes further, when somebody feels deeper within their spirituality, they decide that they wish to be baptized, and then that is when they are initiated into the Khalsa Pant. Now Khalsa Pant, initiated body of Sikhs. Kirpa, that is a very strong concept within Sikhi, to obtain grace. And Sikhs believe that the way to obtain grace is to follow the path, the Guru's path to God. Now we're going to dwell into that a bit deeper and how Sikhs feel about how to attain God and the culture and how the traditions play in. But just to remember in a simple way, Kirpa translate directly to grace. The way Sikhs believe we obtain grace is to follow the Guru's path. Now, Langar. There are quite a few Sikh temples just in this area and all across, all across the world. And a concept within every Sikh Gurdwara is that of Langar. Now, what Langar means is a free global kitchen open to everyone. So 24 hours a day. If right now you were to go to a Sikh temple, you would be given a free, nutritious meal. Because we believe in serving humanity. So when we see that there's, hung not hunger strikes, but when there's famine or a lot of problems going on around the world, Sikhs travel to those places and they give out Langar. So, and I remember in New York when Sandy when the Hurricane Sandy came and other hurricanes, Sikhs, we open our doors for this free lunger because we believe in supporting others. And we believe, you know, what can somebody do without food? You know, it's very important for everyone. So Sikhs always open their doors and anybody, regardless of your race, religion, caste, whoever you are, is allowed a free meal. And then there's the concept of Nam. Now, Nam is Waheguru's name. Sikhs believe that there are countless names for God. The name we refer to God as is Waheguru. So we believe Nam is Waheguru. So the way to experience and connect with the Almighty or God is to chant Waheguru's name and to remember him constantly, to be able to see God within everyone. So the message of Sikhi. Sikhs believe again that there's one creator, Waheguru, our term for God. There's God, Allah, Ram, Lord, Christ. We believe that these are all different names for the one being, for Waheguru, for God. Now we believe it's the infinite source around all of us. And we believe it's the sustainer and the source of everything. So everything we see here, everyone, we believe that God is, or Waheguru is within all of them. It's the creator's light, it's the Jot. Jot means light. It's basically this concept that irregardless of who you are, you have God within you. So it doesn't matter what your gender is, your religion, your race, your nationality, your sexual orientation. We believe that God is within you. And Sikhi, to understand it more simply with the message is, we believe it's a game of love. So it's not necessarily what religion you are, what culture you adhere to, what your race is, what your ethnicity is, but just who has real love for God and to recognize. And to have love for God when we believe that God is within everyone, then you also have to love everyone, so it ties into our daily interactions. Now, to connect with Waheguru, again, we believe that there's a tenth gate. So when you're chanting the name of God, and when you're remembering God, when you're remembering Waheguru, that ties into being able to connect with the divine. Because not only that, it's not that, okay, I woke up in the morning, I meditated, I prayed, I did Simran. Simran is what we believe to be remembering God. So chanting Waheguru, Waheguru. But it goes further than that. Because let's say I woke up for two hours, I did Simran, I chanted God's name. But then I go out and I mistreat people, I lie and I steal. With Sikhi, it goes past that because with your karm, it's everything within your mind as well. So if I'm doing all this, but then I'm going out and I'm mistreating people, then I'm not connecting with the divine because the divine is within everyone. So how am I connecting with Waheguru when I'm mistreating people? And again, it's threefold. So singing the praises of Waheguru within a holy company, you know, so people of like-minded attitudes, other Sikhs or other people of faith, singing the praises, chanting the name of Waheguru. But also, you also have to have an honest living so you can't have one without the other. And then finally, you must serve humanity, which ties into the longer concept of serving others, of being open to others, of always opening your doors for each other. So you can't have one without the other. Again, if I had a really honest living, but then I didn't believe in serving each other, so I just kept completely to myself. If somebody needs my help, I can't do anything. I have other things to take care of, but that's okay because I live honestly. Well, Sikhi doesn't believe in that. You have to be completely onto the path. You know, it's kind of the concept of within Sikhi, it's a thing of 100%. So you have to be all the way up there. You have to be, you have to chant the name of Waheguru. You have to see the divine within all. You have to serve humanity and you have to have an honest living. Now to continue, so we have 10 Gurus. Now Guru roughly translated into English is teacher. But with Sikhi, it goes a bit further. So the first guru, or the first teacher of Sikhism, was Guru Nanak Dev Ji. 
Now, they were born on April 15th in 1469 in Punjab, which now falls into Pakistan after the partition of 1947. Now, during Guru Nanak Dev Ji's time, when they came to earth, there was a lot of destruction on earth. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the history of Eastern Asia, Southern Asia, and the Middle East during the 1400s and the 1500s, but at the time, there were these Mughal leaders. So they would go out and basically there would be destruction. It would, the concept of just, we run into your land, you know, the women were raped, the children were murdered, the men were taken off, and they were turned into slaves. And there was a lot of destruction of a mentality. Because at the time, the rulers thought that the best way to conquer and to defeat a people is to make them like me. You know, so I have a religion, I have a faith, I have a culture. I'm going to destroy your culture, and then you'll have no choice but to adhere to mine. And anybody who opposes that, then we'll just kill them. So there was a lot of destruction, a lot of loss of humanity, and it was just a horrible time to be. So when Guru Nanak Dev Ji came, and they saw all this deceit, and this concept of sati. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with sati, but sati was a concept that if a husband, if a woman is married to a man, and the man passes away, there's a concept of burning the man's, right, for a funeral. But then the woman also has to jump into the fire while she's still alive because her life would be meaningless without the man. So there were practices of this sort. So when we look around the world today, you know, we see extremism. Back then it was at such an extreme level that we believe that the earth was just crying out with this burden of all this hate and this fear. Because if a woman did not readily agree to jump into the fire, if she didn't believe in that philosophy, if she felt that she was independent, that she didn't need to jump into the fire just because her husband passed away, that her life was not meaningless, she would be forcibly put into the fire. So at that time, there's so many examples. You know, it'd be countless. I could go on for hours of the sort of things that were going on. But when Guru Nanak Dev Ji came, they began to spread this message that we can't fall into superstition. We must love each other for humanity. If you're a Hindu, that's okay. You need to be a good Hindu. If you're a Christian, you need to be a good Christian. If you're a Sikh, you need to be a good Sikh. It doesn't have to be that we all have to be this one thing. You have to follow one path, and there's only one way to meet God. And then at that time, obviously, a lot of people, their feathers were ruffled. You know, all these great leaders, they're conquering all these areas. And to have somebody come up all of a sudden and say that, no, sati is wrong. No, you can't be superstitious. Men are equal to women. Women are equal to men. We can't have this concept of that there's only one path. We can't set aside our traditions for years. There was a lot of opposition. But then at the time, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, they took their message past Punjab. Punjab is the nor currently is the north northern state of India. Before that, Punjab was much larger. Before the British and the colonization, Punjab was much larger. But Guru Nanak Dev Ji went past that. They traveled to Rome, Tibet, Mecca, and Sri Lanka to spread this message of humanity. When we're talking about Sikhi, it's kind of when people think Sikhism is a religion. That's true. We identify, you know, to put people into columns and kind of to interact on the daily basis, we kind of bunch it in. You know, that is a Sikh, that is his religion. But when you're dwelling into Sikhi, you got to understand that it goes so much further. Sikhi Sikhi is a way of life, it is a path. That's what we really strongly believe. Because when you have a concept of there's the divine within everyone, then that takes away that I'm sick and you're Muslim. I'm something and you're something else. Because if, the, if we believe the creator is within everyone and our sole mission in this life is to connect with God and to serve others, then these barriers of religion, race, creed, sexual orientation, they begin to diminish. And again, the message Guru Nanak Dev Ji brought to the earth at this time when all these atrocities were occurring was that you can experience Waheguru. It doesn't matter who you are. Anybody can experience the divine. And also that there should be equality and freedom for all. So if I have a belief, I have this concept that I want to connect to Waheguru, but you believe in something else. Let's say you're a Muslim. You believe in Tawheed or you believe in Hajj. You believe that you must travel to Mecca. You believe you must do these things to adhere to your religion. That's okay. Because the same creator that's within me is also within you. We're on a different path, but our target is the same. So that's a very strong concept in Sikhi and what Guru Nanak Dev Ji brought onto this earth. And again, at the time, there are countless examples of people. There are uprisings. At one point, the Mughal emperor at the time, he put Guru Nanak Dev Ji in jail. They, suffered, they went through so much. They tried to torture them, do various, various things, put them in inhumane conditions. But at the end of the day, we strongly do believe that the path to greatness and the path, a truer path for everyone, not just Sikhs. You know, we don't believe Guru Nanak Dev Ji came to this earth for us. We believe it was a message for humanity. Because I feel that even in our American culture, in our Western culture, we all believe that we should be serving humanity, treating each other, not judging people for arbitrary differences. That's a message for humanity. So that's why Sikhi does not actively convert people either. So it makes it very comfortable for me to come and speak on Sikhi because my aim isn't to convert anyone. 
what the concept in Sikhi is really that you understand the path, we explain it to you, we have better interactions because now you understand our mindset. But further than that, when the intention was never walking in to create, to make you like me, but just to make you a better human, then it makes it far simpler to have this sort of conversation when the whole aim is just to understand each other better. So the current guru of the Sikhs is the 11th guru, the scripture, the Gurbani that I mentioned earlier. Now it was compiled by various sanths. Now santh translate to saints. These are people of different religions. So again, on that concept of humanity, it wasn't just the Sikh gurus that composed the scripture, but there were also people of the Hindu faith, of the Muslim faith. And we took the teachings of everyone on how to serve others, on how to connect with the divine, and the gurus compiled that into the Guru Granth Sahib Ji. In 1708, Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the current scripture, if you go into any Gurdwara and you go into the Darbar Hall, Darbar hall that's where the congregation meets, in the center you'll see Guru Granth Sahib Ji. So there will be a throne, and on top of it will be Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj. And they were given the Gurgaddi, which translates to the Guruship. So there were ten Gurus total, and what we could say in a physical form that came in a human form, we could almost say. Because Sikhs believe that the divine light of Waheguru came onto earth in the form of the Gurus to spread these teachings to the world. And then past that, after, in 1708, the Guruship was given to the Gurbani. So we believe that it's not simply a scripture, but our living Guru. So we treat it as that as well. If you go to any Gurdwara, you'll see that they're waving fans over the Guru. They're, the Guru has a bed at night. We serve it in the morning. We do all these things because we believe it to be the living Guru. Now moving forward with that, again, different religions and different backgrounds, irrespective of the traditions and cultures, the best teachings were compiled into this Guru Granth Sahib Ji. So the Gurus, they sought out and they spoke to the Muslims. They traveled with the Hindus because they traveled all over the world. At one point, the Gurus said, they, when they went to Rome, they went to the Catholic churches. And after all of that, they compiled the best teachings into Gurbani and they gave it to humanity. And we believe that it's the true revelation of Waheguru. So we believe that all these faiths, they've come. And we adhere to everything because, again, in Sikhi, the concept of serving humanity. But at the same time, we feel that there are these different paths and Sikhs have chosen this path because it's the most straightforward for us. It was ties into us. So again, it doesn't matter if we actively seek out and we want to convert people. We don't need to do that because we have our path and you have yours and mine's beautiful to mine and yours beautiful to yours. And if we can interact and connect with each other, then we've already won so much. And then with this Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the way it's divided is in poetry and by music. But it's not simply just poetry. If you travel to a Gurdwara, you'll see that people are seeking praises with a harmonium, with a tabla, with drums. But the thing is, it's not simply that it's just to sound good, you know, that we sing it. But we believe that singing awakes the atma. Now the atma, we believe, is the soul. The soul that is within, within everyone and is this concept of waheguru, the light within everyone. So the singing of these praises, of this poetry, it awakens the soul. And it's not just for the Sikhs, it's for everyone. So there's translations in countless languages. People come all the time to our temples to listen to the praises of the divine. Because when the teachings are not for Sikhs, the teachings are for humanity. So when the very teaching is for humanity, when it's not centered just towards these certain people, then it becomes very easy to interact and understand the mentality. Now to move forward to kind of speak on the ten gurus and this concept of religious freedom and connecting with other people. In the East, it's a very, very diverse place. The whole world is diversifying so much. There's people of all walks of life. And at the time, when we're talking about a time that people were oppressed, when you had practices such as sati, when people were being oppressed, then it was important for the ten gurus not only to give this updesh, updesh means teachings, to the Sikhs, but also to expand forward and give teachings to everyone. Again, that concept of these teachings are for all of humanity. So the Guru, we believe, is merged within Waheguru. The Guru is merged within God, and it reflects God's light. So the Guru, God himself, came onto this earth with that light again, with that jyot, with that atma, to give updesh, to give teachings to all of humanity, to get on the right path. So Guru Hargobind Sahib Ji, the sixth Guru of the six, they built a masjid or a mosque for poor Muslims. Muslims came to the Guru, and they said that you have your faith and we have ours but we don't have anywhere we can pray. We're in a time where there's so many atrocities occurring. Please help us. So the guru created a mosque for them and a masjid. St it's still standing today. People go and visit it. So at times when even Ramadan happens, Sikhs and Muslims come together and we support them. When the, after sundown, Sikhs go and we feed them for this concept of just, it's all of humanity. You have your path and we have ours, but yours is beautiful to you and ours is beautiful to us. 
And then Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji, they took it a step further. They gave their life for the freedom of religion. So there was a time when the Hindus, they came to Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji. And again, it was that idea. You have your faith, but your very teachings are for the, all of humanity. You tell us to all be be strict within our traditions and our religions and just because somebody is oppressing us to not turn away and let go of what we believe in and now we have this ruler again a Mughal ruler who's saying that everybody must forcibly convert into Islam and then at that time Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji because they were a very respected figure at that time to bring these revolutionary teachings the ninth guru of the Sikhs they approached the emperor and basically what happened was they said that if you can convert me then you'll be able to convert everybody else. But they were unable to. They gave their life for Hindus, not for Sikhs, because the emperor wished to convert the Hindus. Sikhs as well, but the <laughs> his main thing was that if I can convert the Hindus, then I'll be able to convert these other religions far easier. So they came and they begged before the Guru and they said that, please save us, save our religion. And at that time, Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji, they gave martyrdom, they gave their life for Hinduism. And then again, the 10th Guru, the son of Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji came. Guru Gobind Singh Ji created the Khalsa. So as I mentioned earlier, this initiated body of Sikhs. Because in Sikhi, there's this concept of spirituality and mortality. So whereas we believe the light is within everyone, and we believe in connecting with the Nam and meditation and Simran and remembering God, there's also this very important thing that you can't have one within the other. So if we're to be Sikhs and we say that we are the Khalsa and we're supposed to be representing people and we have this such a rich history of representing humanity and serving others, then it only makes sense that we become initiated and we come together to be able to better serve humanity. And that is what the 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji did. So the Gurus were on this earth from 1469 to 1708 and then the living Guru, Guru Granth Sahib Ji, is what we have today. So the 11th Guru, Guru Granth Sahib Ji, was sealed and it was composed and then given to the Sikhs as the living Guru. So from this day forward, this is your Guru. The Gurbani, the teachings, this light is now your, your teacher and your Guru. Now the Khalsa, to sort of explain more. So Khalsa again is a collected body of committed Sikhs. So you're going to see Sikhs in all walks of life. A question is, well you wear a turban and you're a Sikh, but he's also wearing, he he's, isn't wearing a turban and he identifies as a Sikh. So it all depends on people's level of spirituality. Now a turban is something that expands in a lot of places. Now in the time of the turban, before in the time of Guru Gobind Singh Ji and the time of the other Gurus, a turban was a symbol of royalty and only the kings and the emperors were allowed to wear them. So the Guru Sahib, they saw that there was these downtrodden people and they said that no, we're not going to be restricted, we're not going to force you to not wear a turban, we're not going to force you to look a certain way. Everybody is equal, so why is it that these people feel that they're automatically better? So that's when we're also given the blessing of a turban, as a sign of spirituality, as a, spi as a sign of royalty, but also in a crowd for a Sikh to stand out. So when a Sikh is supposed to be serving others, it only makes sense that we should be readily available. So within a crowd, the Guru believed that anywhere you look, if you see a turbaned man or a woman, if you see a Sikh, you'll know that I can go to that person for help. So again, the Khalsa, the initiated body of committed Sikhs, are the leaders and the protectors of the Sikhs. So let's say your spirituality, you just started on the path of Sikhi, or you've just felt that, you know, you're not sure, you know, you're kind of working out what you want to do with your life, you're not positive at the time. But that's okay, because it's where everybody's at. The purpose of the Khalsa is, again, always to serve and protect Sikhs, but not only that, to fight oppression, uphold freedoms, to be able to provide the basic needs to all. So tying back into Lunger, the purpose of the Khalsa, to give food, clothing, health, and education to all people. Right now across the world, you'll see that there's various charities set up in Syria and places where ISIS is very rampant. Because you have to understand, for Sikhs, this concept of now we have this sort of people are being oppressed and people are being downtrodden, people are being mistreated. This is something that we've been experiencing for hundreds of years. So it's not a new thing for the Sikhs. So when we can look at our history and we can follow the teachings of our Guru, we can see that the very purpose of the Sikhs was to serve others. Then it makes it very easy for the Sikhs. It's not even that it's something that we have to do, you know. It's something that we must do because the very purpose is to serve humanity. So how can we call ourselves the Khalsa? How can we say that we have such a rich and powerful history when we're not willing to serve others? So the Khalsa is dedicated to always serving people. So there are various charities set up to provide food, to provide aid to people across the world, wherever they may need it, wherever they may need it. And again, with a distinct form again. So to be able to look within a crowd and say that that is a Sikh, I can go to him and I can seek help. 
and then they're armed with a kirpan. Now, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the kirpan, but every single Sikh, they carry a dagger. So right now, I have my kirpan, so it's down here. And within Canada and other countries in India and the UK, the kirpan is much more established because when you know, you're know you walking around and people are saying that, well, they're carrying around a sword, they're carrying around a dagger, how's that even allowed? What if they're gonna hurt someone, right? But then in Canada, in UK, and America is coming around as well, there are various laws that protect the word of the kirpan. It's this concept that the kirpan ties into kirpa. So kirpan is mercy. So the kirpan is not for me, but to be able to, if anything happens, I should be able to defend that person who's come and asked for help. If I see something wrong happening, if I see something bad happening, then it's my responsibility as a Khalsa, as a Sikh, to go and serve this other person. So the kirpan is not simply that, oh, they have a dagger that looks really cool, they just carry it around. <laughs> but it's more that the kirpan ties me to be able to serve others. At any point, I'm always prepared. 24-7, a Sikh keeps a kirpan on him. I have a kirpan with me while I shower. <laughs> so we're always ready, this concept within Sikhi that we're always prepared to serve others. And we'll kind of dwell into the kirpan and the distinct appearance of Sikhs a little later in the presentation, but with the distinct form, again, it's not just that you can see a Sikh and now you're going to ask for help, but also that the Sikh is prepared to help you. And again, the idea of being sovereign and having empathy for others, the ideas of having justice and courage and being committed to serving humanity is very important within Sikhi. Because if I'm a Sikh, let's say I follow, I adhere to all the practices of Sikhi, but then I turn around and I'm bashing other cultures, I'm bashing other religions, then I'm not really a true Sikh because the very concept of Sikhi is, again, to see the light of the divine within everyone. There's no differentiation between me and you. To me, my path is beautiful to you, yours is. And if I can serve you and help you follow your path with commitment, then that's the ultimate bliss for a Sikh. Now the purpose, again, this is kind of jumping into the concept of miri and piri. So miri and piri is translated into English mortality and spirituality. So for a sick, do we seek happiness and worldly things? Now I kind of want to delve into the deeper teachings of Sikhi to help you understand. And to do that though in the time we have, just really quickly to kind of explain it, is that the purpose of a Sikh we believe coming into this earth is to re-emerge with Waheguru. So by seeing Waheguru and God within everyone, we're working towards that path to recognize that everything here is Waheguru and in infinite roots and in infinite forms. Root means form. So it's all these different forms that God has taken and our mission is to merge back with Waheguru from where we came. So that concept is what is supposed to tie into everything a Sikh does. So when we're talking about this happiness and worldly things and to seek the soul's union, it comes, well, what is this sort of lofty concept? To be able to explain it in the simplest way, you know, when Sikhs believe that, when you're at night, when you're dreaming, that dream, it feels so real to you. You're only jolted into reality when you wake up. But while you were within that dream, every aspect of it, it felt so real. It felt real as if you were awake. Well, Sikhs believe that we are in a dream, only in our living state as well. So we believe that really this concept that the world is a play but is staged in a dream. So to be able to become unattached from the worldly things, but then at the same time you're going to ask, well, how does serving humanity tie in? How does working with others, how does interacting with others? You see Sikhs doing all these things, CEOs and all these worldly things. Well, why did they do that if they're not going to become attached to this worldly thing anyway? Well, for that, Sikhs really believe that if a small child, let's say, goes into a festival, it's very easy to become distracted by the sights and the sounds and the colors and the games, you know. It's very simple. And we believe that the very reason that the, a Sikh and a person comes into this earth and why they have forgotten, why they can't recognize that God is within everyone, God is within them, Waheguru is within all, is because of the ego. And the ego is a result of the mind. And the mind is a result because it's a child of our thoughts. So to be able to step aside and recognize what's real, to not be distracted by this festival that we could say is this world, to be able to recognize what is real. But then at the same time, there's the, that's the aspect of the spirituality, to be unattached. But then I also talked about serving others and all these things. That's where the mortality ties in. So I recognize that for a Sikh, you know, we're saying that this is an illusion, but at the same time, we still feel we have a duty. Because once we've recognized that the God is within everyone, that we need to connect with Waheguru, that we need to connect with the Lord, at the same time, we also still have to be able to serve people, because we believe it is the hukam. Hukam translates into the command. By the command of God, we came onto this earth. By the command of Waheguru, we have these traditions and cultures, and we do these practices. So it's our duty to recognize what's real, 
but at the same time to be able to step aside and say that I have a duty to serve humanity. I have a duty to ensure that everybody is protected. And again, what ties into both the mortality and the spirituality is dharam. What dharam is justice and righteousness. So the freedom of beliefs. So for a Sikh initiated Khalsa, it's not that I'm going to now, okay, I'm in this worldly place. I've recognized the spirituality. I know what I need to do. But then at the same time, now I have this mortality. So I have to go out and tell everybody about Sikhi and say that this is the concept you should believe in. Follow my path. I have the best path. I have the straightest path. No. To have a freedom of belief, to have compassion for others, to say that what you're doing, that's good for you. If you're happy, if you feel bliss, if you feel that you're on the right path, then as a Sikh, it's my duty to protect you and to serve you and to help you get deeper onto that path, not to try to turn you astray and to say that my path is better. So it ties into serving everyone. So many a times we'll see that, because I've traveled to Buddhist temples, to mosques, to various places, and we'll find that it's very easy to connect with people because when you're walking into a situation with the very idea of, I want to better you as a person, not turn you to a different path, then it becomes very easy to have interactions. Even daily in our work lives, you know, when you work with Sikh coworkers, to be able to understand this really helps because at a time you're like, well, I'm not sure, you know, I don't know much about these people. But then now that you know that the very purpose of a Sikh is to understand their spirituality, but then to also be able to connect and serve others, it makes the interaction far easier. And I feel that it dispels a lot of disbeliefs or misconceptions people have about a people because understanding the mentality of a Sikh is supposed to be just walking into a situation to serve others, to have compassion for others. It allows us to connect at a much deeper level with each other. Now the values. Again, a lot of things you're going to feel they're a bit repetitive. It's because everything within Sikhi is interconnected. In some cultures and some traditions, we feel that, well, there's a reason for this, and that's the reason. There's a reason for this, and that's the reason. They're not connected. But within Sikhi, a lot of these concepts, you're going to find that they're connected, and all of it, it always ties back into this concept of Waheguru, into God being within everyone regardless of your religion, regardless of your sexual orientation. Because we believe that Waheguru is inclusive. Because if God is within everyone, then who can we say is bad? Who can we say is wrong? When the very concept of Waheguru, what we believe to be the infinite, the infinity, is within everyone, then how can we have misunderstandings? How can we say that one person is better than the other? And again, there's the Panj Chor. So Panj means five and chor means thieves. So Sikhs believe that on this path, path of spirituality and mortality, on this path of medium pity, there are five thieves. There are five things that we need to move away from. Negativity. So what are those five things? Lust, anger, greed, attachment, and pride. So having excess pride in yourself, that idea that I'm better than you, my path is better than yours, I know what I'm doing, you don't to be lustful, to have unnecessary anger just over little things, big things, it doesn't matter. Sikhs believe that we must move away from these five negative things and move towards positivity, so walk that path towards truth and con com contentment, compassion, righteousness, and forgiveness for all. There's very strong concepts in Sikhi. Any Sikh you'll approach, you know, when you ask them, well, as a Sikh, you know, what, what is your culture, what does your tradition teach you? They're going to say, well, it tells me to keep away from these negative things and to move towards these positive things so I can become a better Sikh, so I can serve people better. And then the idea of equality, because I feel that a very big issue around the world right now is we're seeing a lot of things in regards to equality, you know. And Sikhi, the concept of equality has always been very strong. Because at the time, as I explained earlier, a time of deep oppression, brutality is a gruesome, a horrid time. Sikhi, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, they move forward because they said that Waheguru, it has no gender. It is the infinite, and it's within everyone. And the gender, it, has, it doesn't have any specific soul. So it's not that I'm a man. For some reason, the light within me is different. You're a female, the light within you is different. We believe that the soul, the atma within, is this partner of God that we must realize on the path of media and piri, on the path of mortality, on the path of spirituality. And we must recognize that. So within Sikhi, it just, just, it just falls in line that everybody would be equal. There's no differentiation between men and women. Because when Waheguru is within everyone, that same light, then how can we say you're different from me? How can we oppress another person? And Sikhi has always been very forward in terms of equality for men and women. So men and women, we pray together, we sit together. Many a times women take the charge. There are women preachers, women lead, women work. So it's not that there are certain things that women can do and there are certain things that men can do. Everything is equal. Because when the light is the same within you, how can I tell you what to do and what not to do? So it's a very deep concept within Sikhi. It goes very far, this idea of equality. So when people approach us and they're like, well, how are women treated in Sikhism? 
Well, when we recognize the light within everyone, it doesn't matter who you are. On arbitrary difference, you're not going to be judged. A Sikh sees the light within you, that God is within you. So when we emerge and we say, well, you know, we see a lot of issues with men and women's inequality. Well, for Sikh, that question does not even come to mind because there's no differentiation between me and you. And to move forward with that again, there's always this concept that maybe, you know, at the time and now as well, they believe that women are sinful. Or there's the idea that women are simply property, that, you know, women, they come very, very, they become scared or they need to be protected and they, they need to be helped. That was never a concept in Sikhi. Sikhi always taught that we are the same. For a Sikh, he cannot see a difference between a man and a woman. So there are strides and strides of equality. And for Sikhs, we hope that the whole world would adopt this to see that there's no difference between a man and a woman. They're arbitrary. The light is within everyone. And again, the concept that kind of deep, diving deeper into what we sort of have in the West and the East, that for some reason that women are the ones that need to act a certain way. Sikhi really believes that it's not women that need to act a certain way, but for the men, you know, who do have these oppressive characteristics, who do believe these certain things, they need to be the ones to move forward and to recognize that the woman is not the issue. It's me that is not recognizing that there's no difference between the man and the woman. So it's a very strong concept within Sikhi that men and women are equal. And to kind of tie into science a bit, we have these cultures and these traditions. So the Big Bang, which is always a big one, we, Sikhi falls in line with the Big Bang. So we believe that Waheguru, God, they made the sound, which we believe a Big Bang, Ong, to make that sound. That's what we recognize as the Big Bang. And then that's how the creation came to be, this concept of Ik Ong, God. So that's a strong concept of Sikhi, which translates to there's a singular Waheguru, there's one God, and the sound, it created this earth, and all the God is all this creation of Waheguru, which is not different, because the light is within everyone. And Nam, we believe that is what supports the creation, the idea of the karam and the karma of what you do will come back to you in a different form, but it goes past that, because Sikhs also believe in reincarnation. So it's not simply that I did something bad on Monday, something bad's going to happen to me on Tuesday. It goes much further than that, from lifetimes and what you're thinking at all times, how you're really serving humanity. Because a lot of times we can see that even within the Sikh culture, within various cultures, you'll say that, well, this is an excellent person. They have the appearance of, you know, of what they're supposed to be. It looks like they're really tied into the culture and traditions. They're serving others. But then if within their mind, their mentality is switched and it's something completely different. Sikhi, we don't believe in that's true humanity. We don't believe that's truly serving others. Your mentality to be in the right state, that I do wish to serve others and that's why I'm doing things, not to have that excess pride those five thieves, again, ties into that concept, but to be pure and recognize that to be unattached but still be able to serve humanity, a very strong concept in Sikhi. And again, Gurbani teaches the scripture of the Sikhs, the living Guru teaches that the air, hydrogen, water, that resulted in life. So what we're finding today, the scientists, they're saying that, well, that was the origins of life. Sikhi also falls in line with that concept. And again, some traditions and some cultures believe that there's seven planes on earth. There are four planes. But Sikhs believe that the earth is not constricted to that. We believe that the universe is infinite. So kind of you're always seeing these scientific discoveries that, oh, there's another universe, there's this, and there's these galaxies that falls in line with Sikhi. Because when Waheguru, when God is infinite, it only makes sense that everything he prevails in would also be infinite. So to kind of get into the place of prayer. So you will probably see various times you might have driven past them, the Sikh temple. So the Sikh word for the temple is the Gurdwara. Gurdwara translates to the Guru's door, and it's the place of worship. Now, the Gurdwara is open to everyone. Anybody can come, because again, if the light was within all, then how can we prevent somebody from coming? Now, within the a Gurdwara, any Gurdwara you go to, there's going to be this structure. So there's two areas. There's going to be the prayer hall, the darbar hall, what we call it, but the prayer hall and the langar hall. So I kind of spoke on langar earlier. The langar, the community kitchen, is prepared by volunteers, and it's a free meal for anybody who may seek one. So when crisis has happened, it's not that, well, we're sitting in Seattle, this is where our Gurdwara is, crisis somewhere in human, like safer in the Haiti when the earthquake struck. Well, that, hope and that happened over there, we can't really serve them here. We do have a community kitchen, but what can we do? We're sitting over here. No. The idea of the langar is to serve people and give them a meal wherever they may need it, to give them aid wherever they may need it. So you'll see many a time that in California even, when they were having issues with the fires going on, the wildfires, the gurdwaras, they opened their doors and they brought langar, they brought these meals and aid to people across California and in various places. There are countless examples. But the langar hall is the idea of, again, that community kitchen. And going past that with this concept of equality, everybody is seated equally. 
So if, whether you're a man or a woman, sexual orientation, your religion, your race, your ethnicity, everybody is seated equally, everybody is served the same way. And the prayer hall. So again, this is where we believe the eternal Guru, Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the living Guru is situated. So in the center, when you walk into a temple, you'll see Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Sikhs will be praying there, men and women will be seated equally. It will be that singing of the hymns again to awaken the soul. And then to learn the Guru's teachings. So that's where the Sikhs go to learn of these stories that I've kind of shared with you of Guru Teg Bahadur Ji saving the Hindus or Guru Hargobind Sahib Ji building a masjid for poor Muslims. That's where we go to learn. For a Sikh, a Gurdwara is sort of a place to recharge but also to connect to the divine. But then going past that, Gurdwara are open to everyone. So we invite people to come openly. And when we're not converting people, it's just a nice experience for people to be able to go to the Gurdwara, to be able to have a free meal, to be able to have longer, to engage with the community. So I encourage everyone, if you have an opportunity, to do go to a Gurdwara. It's a very open place. There are always people there to show you around. So the appearance of the Sikhs, again, that distinct appearance. Now, when you're interacting with a Sikh, you'll notice that they, we keep uncut hair and we have the turban. Again, that sign of royalty and the commitment to the Guru. So I've committed to my Guru that I want to have this distinct appearance. So where anybody may see me, they'll know that I must serve them, that they can distinguish me out of a crowd of many people that is my job to serve them. And five kakas. So a Sikh keeps these five articles of faith. One is the kanga. So within my turban and my hair, I have a comb. So that's to keep my unshorn hair, my uncut hair clean and dry. The kesh, again, the gift of God. We believe that hair is a gift of God, so Sikhs do not cut it. The kashara, so they're undergarments, and that's basically to remind the Sikh to keep away from lust and these desires as sort of a safeguard for a Sikh to be able to always wear that, to know that it is not your job to be engaged in these five chores, to be lost on your path, but to be able to serve others. And the kirpan, which I spoke of earlier, this, this dagger that all Sikhs carry, all Khalsa carry, initiated Sikhs carry, to serve others. Kirpa, to do mercy on others, to be able to protect others. To basically, if I want to summarize the Kirpan, a way to understand it is that Sikhs do not carry the Kirpan for themselves, but to be able to, perself, but to, be able to protect and serve others. And then the Kara. So you'll see that Sikhs, they carry this bracelet. This iron bracelet. This iron bracelet Sikhs have. And that is a reminder to restrain from evil deeds. So if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to hurt someone, if I'm going to steal something, I'm going to see my Kara, and that's going to remind me that I shouldn't be doing that. You'll also see that it's circular to remind a Sikh that everything is the infinite, coming and going. So sort of, a, you could even say a concept of yin and yang, but then for the Sikhi it's much simpler than that. It's the infinite, to remind you at all times, to restrain from doing bad things. And a committed Sikh will always have these five articles of faith. So when you're sort of interacting with Sikhs, it's sort of, you know, people, they think that, well, is it a big deal for a Sikh to take off his turban? Is it a big deal for a Sikh to get away from his kara? Is it a big deal for a Sikh to separate himself for a karpan? And for a khalsa, that is, because for the guru, we're given this gift, we were given this idea that you are to serve humanity, and these are your articles. This, these are important for your path towards media and piti. These are important towards your path towards serving others. Now to speak on Sikhs really quickly within the U.S. So in 1947, before the British colonization, Punjab was Pakistan and India. It expanded quite a bit. But then after the British came, they split up Punjab between Pakistan and India. So Punjab was right in the middle and it was split up. And what the British did was they just drew a line. So they didn't look at the different cultures at the time because there were Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs within those areas. So when they drew that line and just left, there was massive deaths. Millions of people died. Millions of people were raped from people rushing to get on the different sides. So the Muslims, they all navigated to Pakistan. All the Hindus, they went to India. But then there was the third group, the Sikhs. So now Sikhs, they're basically confined within Punjab, that little state. So it used to be where everybody was living equally. All the three religions were harmonious. After the British partition, there were massive deaths. And now in India today, even, we see that there's a lot of inequality. There's a lot of injustice towards religions. Because within India, even, for a Sikh, a Sikh isn't recognized as a Sikh. We're simply a sect of Hinduism by the Indian constitution. So after the British did that, a thing that Sikhs have been struggling for for many years is to explain to people that Sikhi did not stem from Hinduism or Islam. Sikhi is its own distinct religion. And then again, just tying into that, in 1984, there was a genocide against the Sikhs within India. Now, for post-9-11 relations, I want to open that up to your questions, but basically for the Sikhs, the turban made us very easy targets. So people associated the turban with Islam, and they thought that, well, that justified attacking Sikhs. But this concept of Sikhi, which I've been kind of reminding you again and again, that the light was, is within all. So this notion that 
you shouldn't be attacked because you're a Sikh. You're not a Muslim, therefore you shouldn't be attacked. Sikhi is against that, inherently, that idea that you're not Muslim, so that justifies that you shouldn't be attacked. Sikhs believe that nobody should be attacked. It doesn't matter that you mistook me for a Muslim and that's why you attacked me. You shouldn't be attacking me on the basis of my religion, regardless of who I am. And again, six in the US, I don't want to burden you guys with too many facts, but 99% of the people within America you see wearing turbans are six. <laughs> and again, Sikhs have been in the U.S. for over 100 years. There's over 700,000 Sikhs in America today. And again, the respect for the 5Ks. So when we're traveling to airports in various places, you'll always see that, you know, they're like, well, can we remove the turban? We have to remove their karpan. We have to remove their kara. The reason that a lot of Sikhs struggle with this idea is because that our very idea is to be able to serve others. And not only that, you know, Sikhs can understand that there are things that people have to do, right? To protect others, there are certain rules that have to be followed. But it's the idea of this misconception that not understanding what it means for a Sikh to be disrespectful and saying that, no, you must remove your turban, you have no choice, to publicly make a Sikh remove his turban, to make Sikhs uncomfortable. That's something we're really struggling with and working on making progress towards. And again, 60% of Americans feel that they know nothing about the Sikhs, but you guys aren't a part of that 60% anymore, so that's good. And then 76% of them believe they know something of Muslims. And again, the concept is really that people, they tie Muslims and Sikhs together because of the appearance. But for a Sikh, the idea, again, is that it's not so much of an issue that, oh, you're not a Muslim, so you should be treated right. It's that even if you're a Muslim, you should be treated right. Because Sikhs and Muslims and Hindus and Christians, we all come together. So why is it that one religion should be discriminated against and we should set a step aside and say, well, at least they're not going against us, so it's okay. That's something that Sikhs do not believe in. And again, initiated Sikhs, and Sikhs in general, they keep away from intoxicants and alcohol. So many a times, you know, you'll see that a Sikh is walking across the street and somebody is smoking a cigarette and the Sikh changes sides, you know, they change the side of the street they're walking on. That's because Sikhi is really against the use of intoxicants and alcohol because we believe that if your mind is intoxicated, that means you're not in the right frame of mind. If you're not in the right frame of mind, then how are you going to see humanity within everyone? If you have to have this alternate reality, then how are you going to recognize the divine within everyone? Questions? Go ahead. Get up on. Right, so the question was that what do Sikhs do? when they go to the airport and they have a karpan. So right now, basically, is that it's sort of the belief that we have that, you know, when we're traveling, we also have to respect the rules in the sense that there are issues, real issues going on. So for a Sikh, typically, the practice right now is that there's a smaller karpan, you know, that we put around our necks and that we say that, you know, because we can't walk into the airport with our karpan. So for that reason, as of right now, Sikhs, they remove their karpan. In other countries, the rules are a bit different. You know, if you're traveling within India and other places, then the Sikhs are allowed to keep their karpans on. And there are various organizations working on this concept. But as of right now, when traveling across the country or internationally, Sikhs remove their karpan and then we put it back on after we get out of the airport. So this kind of again ties into what I was speaking to earlier in terms of greatest hardship in the West or overall? Overall. overall. So I think really it's misconceptions. So when in America especially or across the world because of the media, the way they represent Sikhs, USA Today a couple weeks ago, they presented a picture, an article on Islamic terrorism, what they titled it, but they had appearance of a Sikh. So when the appearance of a Sikh is supposed to be that serving others to give you the idea that you can come to me at any time to be represented by the media as, no, this is terrorism, it's very difficult for a Sikh to tackle with and something that we have to work on. Because with the very appearance, this distinct appearance is supposed to allow people to know that I'm here to serve you, to help you, but it's being misrepresented that, no, this is terrorism, this is bad. So the greatest threat I would say today is the misconception in media. Because even today in America, when the threats and when Islamophobia and all these things are the highest in America, it isn't when there's a terrorist attack. Statistically, studies have shown that Islamophobia and the hate for minorities is highest every election cycle. So when the elections come forward, I don't want to fall too much into that, but every election cycle, that's when Islamophobia, that's when hate against Sikhs and all of these sort of ideas, these sentiments rise forward because the media perpetuates it. So where Sikhs were in California opening their doors, providing aid to people that were struck by wildfires during hurricanes while they were serving others, the media, they're not reporting that. They're not reporting the concept of Lunger of Sikhs serving others is being reported that this is Islamic terrorism, this is the face of it. So the misconceptions in media and misrepresenting Sikhism. Go ahead. 
right? So the question was that the colors of the turbans, is there any significance? So for the most part, the color is, you know, it's really up to the person. So for me, I wore this tie today, so I was like, okay, this turban will go well with this tie. <laughs> So it kind of depends on the person, but in terms of the significance, blue, orange, and white, they're kind of regarded as, they're, they're kind of the spiritual colors, not necessarily, we don't believe like, you know, you wear one color, you're okay, you're going to heaven, you're good, but the idea of sort of that, these are our more established colors. So in Kent, in the, on May 21st, the Sikh parade is happening, the Khalsa Sirjanad of us, you're gonna see a lot of people wearing orange, you know, that's sort of the religious color. Orange and blue are the main colors that represent the Sikhs, you know, this distinct appearance the wear of the Khalsa, blue and orange, this idea. Yeah, so it all ties into preference. In other parts of the world, Sikhs, uh, women will wear turbans a lot more. But again, it's the idea of that, you know, the unshorn hair. Women, sometimes they f prefer to cover their hairs with a chunni or a scarf or a ramal. So it's all up to personal preference, you know. I mean, at the Gurdwara, that's where you'll see a lot more females wearing turbans. Because again, a lot of that, what ties into, again, is that this misrepresentation, you know. So a lot of women even, which is really sad, you know, they're kind of, they stray away from wearing their turbans and men as well because they don't want to be mistreated. So I know a lot of cases where people say that I do really care about my religion, I do care about my faith, but my family is afraid for me. It's not even the individual in some cases, it's just that their family is saying that, why don't you refrain from wearing your turban, you know, we don't want you to, another hate crime to happen, we don't want you to get hurt. Right, right, right. <laughs> so Sikhs have a really deep military history. So from World War I to World War II to now in other countries because in the Britain, in Canada, basically Sikhs have been able to work around it. So Harjit Sajjan, he's actually the defense minister for Canada. He invented a gas mask that could fit over the, ter the beards and everything. So Sikhs were able to work around this thing. And in terms of, the, there's various forms of tying the turban. So let's say I had to wear a helmet, then I could tie a different style of a turban and kind of just being able to work with it. But the reason why I brought up the militaristic history and everything is that there's these advances in technology and Sikhs, we have to keep our distinct appearance, but at the same time, we also want to ad advance with the world and make sure that we're the best equipped. So the idea of creating a gas mask that would work with the turban, that would work with the beard, you know, these various things. So really, we just adapt to the situation. So you can wear a motorcycle helmet? Yeah. <laughs> just depends, because some Sikhs, you know, they might... It's because the hair, my hair's in a bun right now because my hair comes down to my ankles, uncut hair. So I tie it, but then it doesn't look like it comes down to my ankles because it's tied into a bun. So you can adapt to the situation. And in other countries, like in Canada, for example, I mean, and in India, they don't require Sikhs to wear a helmet. They, they just wear the turban. So why oh, good the question could you please re repeat the question one more time So Waheguru is just another name for God. So there's Allah, Ram, Christ, Lord. Waheguru is what we call God. And Waheguru is the infinite. It's the light within everyone. So Waheguru is not just within one or two individuals, but it's within everyone. And that's where these concepts of God is within everyone comes from. So we can't differentiate between male, female, you know, gay, straight, whoever, because we believe Waheguru, this light, God, this infinite, is within everyone. Ah, okay, the Guru, okay. So what we believe is that the Guru, when they came to this earth, so while God is, while Waheguru is within all the humans, because again, that idea of the ego, right? So we are made to forget this because we become distracted with the world. So the Sikhs, because God is still within us, we fail to recognize it. You know, we believe we're separate from God. The Gurus were the ones that they came onto this earth and they were transparent. So they were completely connected and recognized God's light. So we believe that they're God's light on this earth. So God is still within everyone, but the gurus were the ones that came as the guru's true light, and they were able to recognize that God is within them. So it's kind of the idea that we believe that the guru and God, they're not separate. The light is the same, and the gurus have recognized that light. Are there evil people? Ah, uh, okay. So when it ties into, you know, good people, bad people. Sikhs don't believe that anyone is really, you know, we could say that they're inherently evil at a very deeper concept. So it's not that, you know, somebody goes and they rape and murder someone saying that, no, no, that's not a bad person. But it's sort of, you know, God, it's twofold. 
So going deeper into it, there's still God and the light within everyone. And because of their karma, because of their karma in one way or another, that, you know, they're going to be judged for what they've done. So what is the idea of that, you know, are there evil people? We believe that there are people that do bad things, for sure. You know, so there is the idea that, you know, say Hitler, yeah, that was an evil person, that was a bad person. We still believe that God is even within him, is even within the evil people. So it's not so much that there's no evil people. There are still evil people, but the light is still within them, and because of their karma, they will be judged accordingly. Anyone else? So I think really a big thing is just interact. Oh, the question was that what can you guys do, what can we do to help better interact and communicate with the community? So basically, I think a really big thing is just things like this, you know, being able to come here and speak on Sikhi. And another thing is interacting with the community. So May 1st, there's a huge parade for Sikhs, for Vasaki, to come down to that because there's a lot of stalls, people giving more teachings. And going past that to just be able to understand who the Sikhs really are. Because, you know, to not just stop that, okay, I had this presentation, I now, who the Sikh, I now know who the Sikhs are. But to be able to go forward, tell your friends, tell your family that, no, this is a Sikh, this is what they believe in. And going past that a bit further, just in your daily interactions, to kind of walk into that mentality that this is a Sikh, these are the things I can say, these are the things I can't say, this is how I have to act, but to understand the mentality of a person to be able to connect deeper with them. Because I really do be believe that it's an individual thing, you know. I don't believe that just throughout our city or our state or our country that we're going to be able to create these massive reforms where automatically people are automatically treated equally. But if at an individual level we can have better communication, we can have better connections to ask these sort of questions, to get these dialogues going individually, that expands into our local community. Our local community goes to the state, to the state, to a global level. So really, in the lamest terms, what can you guys do is really just continue to interact with the community and to understand them and support them in the ways that you can. So when a Sikh child is born, there, there's, initiate, there's initiation, so there's a sort of ceremony, right, when the Sikh is born. So after that, from birth, they become Singh and Kaur. And then after that, when they make the decision that they want to move forward and they want to be initiated into the Khalsa, that's at whatever age. So for me, I was seven years old. So when I was born, uh, the first initial ceremony was done. Okay, you're a Singh, you're a Sikh. But then I decided to commit further and become baptized when I was seven years old. Uh, so the Cossacks and the Khalsa, is there any relationship between the two? So no, there's no relationship. Khalsa, initiated body of committed Sikhs. Go ahead. Uh, with the naming Sikh, you said you are, is there also a family name? Right, so the thing with the family name I kind of mentioned earlier, the family name is typically it ties into caste. And Sikhi abolished caste for these ideas of sati, of these unfair practices. So automatically, by your family name, if you're a certain caste, this is the most you can achieve in your life. This is the most you can be for. If you're this caste, you can only be a warrior. If you're this caste, you can only be like a carpenter. So there are family names, but once a Sikh, you'll sometimes see that there'll be somebody who's not initiated, who hasn't been baptized. They'll still use their family name along with Singer Corps. But once the Sikh does become a Khalsa, they do become initiated, then they let go of that. And then it kind of becomes, well, there's probably a lot of Harjot Singhs around the world. How do you guys differentiate between the two? Then that ties into where you're from. So back in Punjab, my pend would be Billy Chaharam. That's the name of my pend. So I would be Harjot Singh Billy Chaharam. So that's how you know him. Or because I live here, I'd be Harjot Singh Seattle. So that's how you differentiate between the two. Because caste, you know, it was really tied into people's mentality. It really oppressed people. So Sikhi was inherently against the idea of caste, that by birth, that you're only worthy of a certain thing. So I feel a lot of the concepts we hold dear in America, because I was born in Dallas, Texas, so I was raised there for a fair amount of time, and kind of these concepts of, you know, freedom of belief and religion just ties into even our Bill of Rights. These concepts, they fall in line with Sikhi, but I feel that Sikhi even takes it further, because in America, when we have these issues of Islamophobia, of going through these trends at one point, the Red Scare, the, you know, the Japanese immigrants, of different people, of civil rights issues, when we have these issues, I feel that Sikhi, it ties into the American culture and also helps it in the sense that Sikhi, Wahiguru is within everyone already. So it ties into these same American beliefs. But in terms of assimilating into the culture, I feel, I feel many a time, you know, one thing if I could say is sort of a struggle is that making sure that the youth and everything, that they find a balance, you know. So to not become so integrated within American culture, to not become so integrated with their local culture, but to be able to gain the best and to kind of have 
a balance of, okay, these are my fit cultures and they intertwine with my American culture and I can move forward in that sense. So really it's just finding a balance, which is really an individual thing. So we try to support you know, our community. We don't say that, you know, okay, you're a Sikh, you can't interact with anyone, you can't believe in any American culture. But no, to interact with it, to understand it, and to be able to, be able to move forward and say that Sikhi teaches me this, my American culture teaches me this, now I'm gonna move forward with these two concepts, intertwined. All right, thank you all. Thank you so much. Once again, please thank Harjit Singh. And, and thank you all as well for your openness, for your willingness to engage, and most importantly, for our service to the community. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.